To all the attendees, in one minute, we're going to start the lecture by Dr. John Shin. Welcome to the third and last day of the 2021 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. We are grateful for your attendance and support. This has been an amazing experience, and with your support, we hope to keep innovating in the academic field of neurosurgical science. Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We have the honor today of having Dr. John Shin. He's the Director of Spine Oncology and Spinal Deformity Surgery, Director of Spine Innovations Research Laboratory at Mass General Spine Neurosurgery Network, all in Massachusetts General Hospital, Associate Professor on Harvard Medical School. Today at the IWBNC, Dr. Shin is going to share his lecture titled Reconstruction Strategies and Planning Considerations for Cervical Spine Deformity. Please type write your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them after the end of Dr. Shin's intervention. Welcome Dr. Shin and thank you, it's all yours. Great, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Good morning, good afternoon or evening, wherever um, everyone is. And uh, it, it's a real pleasure to connect and hopefully someday we'll be able to do this live. Well, today I thought that we would discuss uh, some reconstruction strategies and considerations for cervical spine deformity. And I hope this is informative and I'd like to present some cases and uh, we can certainly discuss this afterwards, but uh, I hope that this will be challenging and will uh, challenge you to think about your own cases. And uh, I think this will highlight uh, some of the considerations that we have as spine surgeons uh, in addressing these complex pathologies. Here are my disclosures. So when we think about cervical lordosis, we know that this is an essential component of not only musculoskeletal health, but also our global spinal balance and alignment. And we know that there's significant variability in lordosis in general, uh, and we're able to accommodate various degrees of lordosis. And we see that in studies looking at normal controls as well as patients with various symptoms such as radiculopathy, stenosis, or myelopathy. And you can see here, these are just x-rays of two patients who are asymptomatic, uh, but with completely different alignments in the cervical spine. You can see on the left, this person has a sagittal vertical axis, which appears normal without giving you the measurements. And on the right side, that sagittal vertical axis alignment is significantly abnormal. And you can even see there appears to be a step off there in the lower subaxial spine. So what causes a deformity? Uh, a lot of times it can be muscular. So patients with whiplash or chronic uh, neck pain or uh, habitual problems, you can see that. And sometimes that can improve with physical therapy, massage therapy, various interventions and treatments. Uh, and so the assessment of that is really multidisciplinary. Well, what are some other causes? Well, one of the most common causes are post-laminectomy, post-surgical causes of deformity. Now that can be because of pseudarthrosis, instrumentation failure, what have you, it can happen. Now in the era of instrumentation and so many different types of reconstruction strategies, it's not so much post-laminectomy, although we do see that, it may be related to maybe fusing the patient in kyphosis or possibly developing things like PJK, DJK, and hardware pullout. And then there are also less uh, common causes such as those related to infection, cancer, post-radiation necrosis. A lot of what I do is also in oncology and those are some very challenging cases trying to correct for cervical alignment in patients who have had uh, head and neck dissections, radiation therapy, um, but those are rare, but also problematic. And then we get into a host of conditions which are quite challenging and uh, 
and need to be really evaluated prior to surgery. And this includes, you know, different neuromuscular syndromes and anterior soft tissue contractures, inflammatory disorders. And so having a multidisciplinary plan involving rheumatologists and neuromuscular neurologists uh, when needed is very important. Here's a patient that I treated years ago who presented, and you can see that uh, this patient cannot look straight. Their horizontal gaze is severely impaired, and you can just imagine how difficult it is to do things, not only just, let's say, brush your teeth or, you know, uh, go for a walk, but can you imagine driving or trying to do other things by primarily looking down at the floor? And you can see here that the patient has a fracture in their rod. Uh, this patient had a cervical thoracic fusion done elsewhere many years ago and presented with a severe pain. And you could almost see the rod, the, the deformity and the distortion poking through or pushing up on the skin. And you can see that indentation on his shirt. And this is a representation. You can see a fracture here. And what's interesting here is that, you know, when we do these operations and this patient had something at the cervical thoracic junction, you can see where that stress riser is. For anyone that does these operations, you know that getting arthrodesis across junctional zones can be very challenging. And in this case, you can see where that fracture was, was right at the 3555 uh, connection between the rod, uh, you know, between the cervical and the thoracic instrumentation. Um, and so uh, that, in this case, cause a significant kyphosis and deformity. So what, of the, what, what about the consequences of deformity? Well, what happens over time? Well, what happens over time, and this happens to us as well, right? Uh, when we're operating for a long day uh, or you're at the computer for a long time, you get myofascial pain symptoms. You just know that your posture is not great. Our shoulders elevate, our trapezius muscles get more fatigued. This leads to disc degeneration, postural compensation, and eventually potentially spinal cord compression and nerve injury. And that's where things become very problematic for us. But we're able to accommodate that to a certain extent with postural compensation. So when you develop kyphosis, you start end up compensating in other ways along the musculoskeletal chain. So whether it's pelvic retroversion, bending at the knees, uh, you know, we're, we're, we'll do everything we can to try to look horizontal, look straight ahead to, because we're meant to stand on two feet and be vertical. Progressive myelopathy, loss of, mo loss of motion, limited visual gaze, swallowing problems, that all can happen. And like I said, it stresses the musculoskeletal system and patients can develop subsequent low back, hip and joint pain. And I'll show examples of that. Post-laminectomy kyphosis, uh, pro probably less common now with the advent of posterior instrumentation, anterior and posterior instrumentation, but we still see this. And I know that in my practice and, uh, and in uh, patients that I see, we see this especially as neurosurgeons and possibly patients who've undergone, let's say, laminectomy for intradural tumor, like a meningioma or an intrinsic a spinal cord lesion. Uh, many years ago, whether they're in their as adolescents, uh, young adults, or even older adults, over time they can develop post-laminectomy kyphosis. Uh, patients who've undergone multi-level stenosis uh, operations, laminectomy, uh, can also develop this phenomenon. And in, in in this case on the MRI, you can see that that effect is dramatic, where the spinal cord is essentially bowstrung over the cervical vertebrae. But in some cases, you know, on an MRI, it may not be impressive because when they're lying down on the MRI table with their head supported and the spine is not loaded, it may not really accentuate the deformity. And that's why getting upright standing x-rays is always helpful because you get not only a representation of the loading of the spine, but also consideration of the um, the contribution of the weight of the skull, the musculoskeletal structures, the trapezius muscles, the scapular muscles in terms of maintaining alignment. And you really get a picture for how that patient is trying to accommodate. So in any case where I'm suspecting a cervical deformity, we're routinely getting cervical, cervical spine x-rays as well as full length scoliosis x-rays. Here's another patient who underwent previous surgery 
uh, with anterior and posterior operation, you can see here that, again, this patient is looking down towards the floor. Uh, just without even looking at the pelvis, you can see the relationship of the head here thrust forward and the prominent trapezius here uh, that's there. And that, you know, and she was remarking how just over time uh, she was getting this really large sort of muscle band that she could not get rid of with physical therapy and uh, massage. And uh, when I was a fellow at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Dr. Ed Benzel referred to this as a trapezius sign as one of the signs of really stressors to the support structures at the cervical thoracic junction. And that is very evident here. And when you see patients, you'll see notice over time that they will develop this. And you can also see here the atrophy associated with the posterior extensor musculature. And in this patient, you can see the prominent spinous processes here uh, posteriorly. And uh, she initially came to me for evaluation of that. Uh, someone had suspected that this might be a tumor. Uh, and so uh, when you look at when you look at this, and I, I'm sure many of you have seen this, you see a well-heeled posterior midline incision, but you see the prominence of the dorsal spinous processes. And this is the CAT scan of this, her CAT scan. You can see that she had a cervical thoracic fusion. You can see that there's pull out of the cervical lateral mass screws uh, at some of these levels. Rod is intact, but uh, you can also see that she had an anterior operation and there's been pull out and failure of, uh, of, this, of this construct. And so without really getting into how I fix this or, you know, what do you do here? Is it even worth doing something here? Uh, again, this is a CT myelogram, and you can see also this patient had some cabling or some wires here posteriorly at the time of surgery. You know, you know, I would challenge you to think, well, in this case, you know, what would you do? How would you do it? And should you do it? Uh, you can see this patient is not so young. They've already gone through an extensive anterior and posterior operation. And something we think about as spine surgeons, especially those who do complex surgery is, uh, it's not just about improving the radiographic features, but, you know, we think about the invasiveness of what we do. We also think about the frailty of the patient, um, and, and they go hand in hand. And right now, uh, there's some really great work being done on this, uh, various groups, our group, the ISSG, looking at frailty, looking at invasiveness and patient-reported outcomes, radiographic alignment parameters, and really studying, you know, uh, what are the drivers of outcomes here? Um, and in the context of, should we do it? You know, who do we do these operations on? And then we get to the, the fun stuff, right? Is the technical, is how do we do it? Osteotomies, anterior, posterior, does this patient need a sternotomy, partial sternotomy, you know, manubrial window, posterior osteotomy. But if you can see, as you can see here, there are a number of considerations. Uh, with regards to the anterior instrumentation, the posterior instrumentation, the screw pull out, the pseudarthrosis that's there. So just to set the table, something I, I just want everyone to think about as we move forward. So again, how to fix it? Should it be fixed? What's the danger involved? We all take on risks. We all have different risk tolerances, surgeon and patient alike. And these are the major considerations I want you to think about as we go through these slides. So nervical, normal cervical alignment, it's unique to each person, right? And there, there's a lot of data. You can do a PubMed search and you can see that, you know, this may vary by age, gender, uh, you know, you can look at different racial clusters, uh, different, um, you know, ethnicities. I mean, that we, we see this, these patterns. Uh, and when you look at international journals and what's being published, there's really great insights there. And the goal is to maintain balance and we wanna preserve and improve their function. So we think about spinal balance, we think about alignment, that's really been uh, emphasized in the last decade or so. And we think about that in the sagittal plane as well as in the coronal plane. And in cervical deformity, uh, especially kyphosis, it's more of a sagittal issue more than coronal, but we do think about the coronal uh, alignment, especially between C2 and T1. I took my kids to this, uh, this uh, exhibit at a museum uh, several years ago uh, called the Body Worlds, and I thought it was fascinating. And um, I took this picture, and this just basically shows everything that we deal with, right, as, as uh, spine surgeons, whether you're 
neurosurgeon or orthopedic, but especially as neurosurgeons, right? We start with the cranium, you see the entire spinal axis, the nerve roots. And, you know, when we're thinking about correcting these deformities, which is really involving the musculoskeletal system, we have to think about the nerves, the spinal cord and everything uh, underneath and how the bone and those structures and doing osteotomies are going to impact and affect those nerves and those nerve roots. And so it's delicate balance between uh, manipulating, reconstructing the spine and preserving neurological function. So overall, we need to understand, is the cervical issue compensation or is it the driver, right? So the patient may come to you and we need to figure out, do you operate on the cervical? Is it a lumbar issue? Which one do you do first? Which one is really the problem? And what part, and is the cervical spine really the main issue biomechanically and alignment wise, or is it really compensating for maybe a low lumbar issue? Maybe the patient has a flat back deformity uh, and, uh, you know, they're sort of uh, hyperextending their spine, compensating for that. So we think about alignment parameters, and there are always a lot of different parameters. And this can be, you know, overwhelming, confusing, even to, you know, our students and residents and fellows. But we try to keep it simple. And, you know, when the cervical spine deforms, this is a great paper uh, by my colleague, Chris Ames, that was published in JNS Spine. Uh, and this is, you know, looking at, you know, some of these very, these characteristics, and we know that the chin brow vertical angle is important, right? That just gives us a quick and easy way of assessing, you know, what is the implication of that kyphosis? Uh, and you can see sort of what that is relative to the horizontal. Then with regards to lordosis, there are many ways to uh, measure uh, the lordosis between C2 and C7, but it's very helpful. And now with a better understanding of the T1 slope, the T1 slope is essentially uh, angulation measured from the superior end plate of T1 and the horizontal. And this really gives us an idea of, you know, how much cervical lordosis that patient needs, right? So just like in the uh, lumbar spine or the lumbopelvic parameters, we think about the association between the pelvic incidence and the lumbar lordosis. And it's often cited that that needs to be plus or minus nine or 10 degrees. We also think about this concept of the T1 slope and the uh, cervical thoracic inlet and the cervical lordosis. And so thinking about that has a lot of implications. And so uh, we routinely measure these. And, you know, I think about this, especially if I'm just doing a degenerative case, you know, about the implications of maybe stopping fixation at C7 or crossing the cervical thoracic junction. Uh, you know, that that is a consideration. And still, there's a lot of work that needs to be done with that. But you will see that there is now work being published looking at patient reported outcomes uh, and uh, radiographic outcomes, uh, you know, stopping at C7, crossing the junction, and how that relates to these parameters, cervical lordosis and T1 slope. So it's an exciting area of research. But, you know, to be sure, you know, uh, our knowledge and our understanding has to improve. Now, here's a cartoon illustration again of, uh, again, is the cervical spine the driver or is it compensating, right? So in C, as you can see here, this is a, in C, this is a caption, an illustration of someone who has, let's say, a flat back deformity. And you can see uh, in this illustration um, how that's represented you know, increased pelvic tilt, straightened lumbar lordosis, global positive SVA. Uh, and uh, you can see what that means for the cervical spine. Now, in the context of a hyperkyphotic cervical spine, you can see that there's an exaggerated thoracic kyphosis, kyphosis in the cervical spine, that patient, that SVA is actually negative because they're really hyperlordosing retroverting their pelvis to stand upright. Uh, and this obviously has impacts on their compensation uh, in their thoracic spine, in their cervical spine. 
we know that the alignment parameters, uh, it, you know, uh, impact patient reported outcomes uh, for myelopathy and also for de degenerative issues. And this is one of the earlier studies from 2014 that really demonstrated this. And there has been subsequent work looking at this. And this was, you know, the, one of the earliest papers that really demonstrated the impact of standing x-rays and standing alignment on outcomes after posterior cervical fusion surgery. And this really helps set uh, the in initial target for that SVA of approximately four centimeters, which we use now. Uh, along those lines, again, uh, going back to that concept of the T1 slope, it's a very important parameter. And a lot of, there have been a lot of studies on this, and there's some colleagues from Asia and Korea that have uh, a lot of expertise on this and looking at the relationship of T1 slope to cervical lordosis. And basically the general idea is that if you, the larger your T1 slope, you probably need more cervical lordosis uh, to maintain neutral gaze and for proper alignment. Uh, with a T1 slope that is less steep, you need less cervical lordosis overall. And that's just what the left and the middle caption demonstrates here. Again, cervical spine deforms. We think about the lordosis, the T1 slope. So let's get to surgery, okay? Now we talked about with all of these interventions, we have to be mindful of the invasiveness of surgery as well as the, the patient's frailty. And there are a lot of ways to assess both. Uh, and, and that is a moving target. But when we think about surgery, technically, we have a lot of tools and approaches. We can approach this anteriorly, standard anterior cervical discectomy infusion, single level, multi-level, uh, corpectomy, uh, which we're all uh, familiar with, whether for onco oncologic reasons, infection, um, deformity, DGEN, OPLL, and also osteotomies. Anterior uncinate osteotomies can be very effective to uh, further uh, opening up the cervical spine. Then posteriorly, we have multiple types of osteotomies, posterior column osteotomies, which is essentially a foraminotomy taken all the way out laterally, um, as well as pedicle subtraction or three column osteotomy. And then we have combined approaches. So when we think about osteotomies, uh, essentially it's how do we cut the bone, right? How do we cut the bone, preserve, preserve the neurology, respect the surrounding soft tissues, the ligamentous structures, and especially the vascular structures, right? So with an anterior cervical approach, respecting the carotid artery, respecting the venous structures, uh, avoiding the carotid sheath, you know, knowing where the vertebral artery is. I remember when I was a fellow, I went to a course and I, I, I saw a really great talk by Dan Rue, who said he makes his fellows look at the axial T2s of every MRI before surgery to make sure they can follow the flow voids of the vertebral artery. And I agree, that's so important. With, with any cervical spine operation, I'm always looking at the flow voids, the course of the vertebral artery, you know, where it's inserting, where it's prominent. And you'll be very surprised uh, with the uh, range of uh, variation in terms of where the vertebral artery is. And so we have multiple ways, right? And this has been classified in a number of ways. I just, I, I like pictures and I like, I'm very visual. So I like these type of uh, cartoon representations. And it just gives that idea, right? So, uh, so here, this is standard ACDF, right? It's staying within the medial border of the uncinates. You can get a great nerve root decompression. Uh, and we're all used to that. Uh, staying with anterior, you can see the Next extension of that is really the anterior osteotomies. And that means really taking away that uncinate process on both sides, taking away the overgrowth of the uh, osteophytes and uh, really getting out. So you're distal to the pedicle and you're really seeing that bulb of that nerve root and you could chase that all the way out. And again, the concern here is, you know, being mindful that the vertebral artery is just gonna be just lateral to that, um, but very effective. And then you have the corpactomy, which again, we're very used to. Uh, and if needed, you can take all of that out, uh, which is very destabilizing as you can see here. Now with the posterior approach, we're all used to laminectomy, uh, foraminotomy as well, but with the posterior grade two osteotomy, it's essentially taking all that bone out, skeletonizing uh, that nerve root all the way out. You can chase it to the posterior lateral musculature and you're getting a real pedicle to pedicle bony reception there can be very effective. Uh, and then we have three column osteotomy, which is essentially taking all of the posterior complexes, the facet joints, 
uh, creating a wedge into the vertebra to provide a maximal uh, closure uh, uh, to, to obtain the, uh, an excellent degree of correction. I'm gonna show illustration of that. So let's get into some cases. Um, and uh, we can certainly talk about this and uh, please, uh, you know, free field to challenge. And that, that's what makes spine surgery intellectually stimulating. And we all learn and uh, grow from each other. So uh, here's a 46 year old who presents with severe neck bilateral arm pain and weakness. They're having gait and balance issues, tripping and falling, symptoms progressing over three months, uh, brisk reflexes on exam, uh, grossly moving everything, but 46 year old healthy, healthy mother using a cane can't raise hands over the head. And you can, and this, this clearly is a patient who is being debilitated by these symptoms, classic symptoms for myelopathy. And this is her MRI. Uh, so our, our neuroradiology colleagues always cringe when a surgeon show uh, MRIs during conferences because we only show a couple slices and uh, it doesn't really give a true characterization of what the scan shows. So I try to select some of the most pertinent imaging studies here. And as you can see here, this patient has multi-level uh, spondylosis, right? And you can see uh, based on this MRI, you know, the cervical lordosis appears to be somewhat straightened, but you can see that there is disdegeneration uh, and issues here at C3-4, C4-5, C5-6, C6-7. You know, this, this dark band of T2 hypointensity makes me think about or suspicious for some type of ossification or uh, some other process that's there. So that's something to think about. Though when I scan side to side, I'm not really seeing that consistently, but I am seeing significant degeneration uh, at multiple levels. And you can see the impact on the central canal, the spinal cord, you can see the ventral compression of the cord, some signal, chain, signal change is evident there as well. These are the axial images. And again, this patient is 46 years old, uh, impaired and having symptoms of myelopathy. Right. So the question is, when you look at this anterior, posterior combined, would you do it all posteriorly? Is there anything else you need? CAT scan, raise your hand, x-ray. Um, but we're all thinking about that, right? So everyone who's watching that, this is thinking, okay, like, well, you know, maybe I'll do a laminectomy, maybe I'll do laminoplasty, maybe I'll do multi-level posterior laminectomy infusion, maybe I'll do this all anteriorly, maybe I'll do this all anteriorly and posterior, so many ways to consider, right? These are the standing x-rays, right? So she has some pain, but she's not wearing a collar. Um, and I have x-rays over a period of six weeks and it just looks like this, right? You could argue, is there an element of muscle spasm here? Possibly, but I have two x-rays over a six week period of time with, you know, that is really relatively unchanged. Well, I decided to do this through a multi-level anterior cervical approach. I did a CT of the cervical spine, which demonstrated there was no OPLL, maybe some calcifications or protuberances behind the vertebral bodies, but not compressive, but it was really primarily disc-based. And so I did this through a four-level anterior cervical discectomy infusion. You can see here six weeks post-op what that alignment looks like uh, with the uh, plate, anterior plate, multi-level uh, grafts, and uh, the tracheoesophageal structures here. And over time, this is about now 18 months post-op, you can see that that alignment is preserved and how that compares to pre-op. So you look at the orientation of the spinous processes, the lamina and the facet joints here, and now you can see that we have preserved lordosis and you know the facet joints are not distracted. They're aligned nicely, no evidence of proximal or distal uh, failure at this point. So I found this very effective, just starting first with a subaxial uh, kyphosis case. Next case, this is a 65 year old woman, some medical comorbidities, hypertension, heart issues, coming with severe neck, bilateral arm pain and weakness. Deltoid bicep strength, three out of five, weak hand grips. She's in a wheelchair. She's sitting like this in the examination chair with her shoulders all the way up to her ears. Poor gait, has orthopedic issues in her knees, her ankles. Uh, I, I think we can all picture sort of what that patient looks like. And we, we've all uh, shared that kind of uh, patient who comes in really debilitated, probably not in the best of health, but relatively uh, functional with these neurologic symptoms. And this is what I see. This is the MRI. So again, we can see here there is severe subaxial degeneration, 
four, five, five, six, six, seven. You can see the end plate reactive changes here. Based on the MRI, you can see there's overhanging osteophyte. Disc is really, there's really not much there, but you could see the distortion of the spinal cord here, signal change evident. CT of the cervical spine demonstrates this osseous ridging here, uh, you know, bony overgrowth and the, the changes that are there. These are the standing x-rays. And this, I think, really helps visualize and accentuates uh, uh, the alignment overall. And you can see here how between four and five, there's a step off. And again, this patient has deltoid bicep weakness, pretty profound. Uh, you can't even imagine where the neural foramen is here. Uh, and you can see the, the changes there and the step off between the posterior elements. With extension and flexion, you're seeing not much motion, although with flexion, there may be somewhat more angulation. So question is, how would you approach this? It's almost bone on bone. The patient has severe C5 and C6 nerve root compression. Which operation, which technique is gonna give you maximal decompression of those nerve roots so that this patient can get function? And prior to this, I had her evaluated by an orthopedic surgeon, no shoulder issues, no rotator cuff issues. Uh, it was really primarily C5 based, you know, no evidence or suspicion of a biceps tendon issue. Uh, so this is really uh, an issue of severe, you know, cervical nerve root compression with some myelopathic features. And what is the strategy that's going to give you maximal nerve root decompression here? Are you going to be able to do that through a posterior approach alone? Is the posterior approach alone going to give you the benefit of addressing the alignment? You look at that extension x-ray, you can argue, well, that sagittal SVA is within four centimeters. So if you decompress, lock her in, you'll probably achieve that alignment. But something I want to point out is, I, I'm not, I cut off the jaw here, but if you look at that occipital C1, C2 angle, look what's happening here, right? So look at neutral and look at flex. So you may look at this and think, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna position, I'll put in the Mayfield, I'll position her in the OR, we'll get, we'll reproduce that extension film and I'm gonna decompress wide, take down the facets and just lock her in, right? But if you do so, you know, that result, you, if you just look at C2 down, you may get that result, but you know, this patient, what this is showing us is that she's maximally extending and really compensating at the cervical, uh, cranial cervical junction. And uh, this is not a good sign. You know, that occipital C2 angle is, is zero, if not negative. Uh, and that demonstrates a significant compensation for that patient. So there are a lot of ways to classify cervical deformity. And I really, uh, I, I like this uh, ISSG cervical deformity classification. Uh, and it just helps provide a framework, right, um, to, to think about these cases and to think about uh, various components in terms of alignment, uh, the clinical situation, um, you know, it, the correlate for me for this uh, with um, oncology is kind of like the GNOMES paradigm by uh, Mark Bilski, as well as the SIN score. It's kind of, it provides a structural framework that helps me my trainees think about, okay, how do we think about this in an organized fashion and how do we create a nomenclature and the language that we can communicate, talk about, write about, study, uh, and think about these cases, right? And so we go through that exercise. And for this patient, I did this through a combined anterior and posterior approach. Uh, I wanted to maximally decompress those C5 and C6 nerve roots. And so for me, it was a matter of trying to elevate, uh, perform osteotomies, get the C5 and C6 nerve roots completely decompressed through anterior osteotomies, posterior osteotomy. And you can see here at C5, you can see the, the correction increased height. That C4 is now no longer sublux over C5. This entire wedge of bone is gone. So the uncidence has been taken down. Posteriorly, the uh, posterior facets have also been resected, uh, drilled out uh, with uh, cervical thoracic instrumentation, as you can see here, okay? And this is just a CT demonstrating that. You can see here uh, the correction that is there, the anterior plate. These are the graphs uh, used for that. Uh, and uh, this is uh, now after surgery, no longer in a wheelchair, actually able to stand. Uh, and, uh, and you can see here that uh, what the cervical alignment looks like relative to um, the, uh, the lumbar. And again, you can see here that um, 
yeah, I'm very happy with this, but I was also very happy to look at that, uh, you know, occipital C2 angle in that interval. You can see that, you know, she's not real hyperextending to look straight. I mean, she's looking up just because the x-ray techs have her, you know, have them put their hands over um, their chest so they're not leaning forward or holding a bar, but it just shows that, you know, she's not maximally extending her neck to maintain that gaze. Again, pre-op and post-op. Let's move on and increasing the complexity here in the last several minutes. And I, I definitely want to get to some discussion and question and answer. Uh, I know I'm just throwing a lot uh, out at the audience, but here's a patient who underwent multi-level laminectomy years before. And uh, this was pretty dramatic. Uh, this is just what he looks like coming into clinic. And you can see really prominent trapezius muscles here, right? But he also had this really abnormal soft tissue swelling in the back. And, uh, you know, this is not 3D, but you can imagine it's just, it's almost coming out of the, the, out of the screen. You can see a well-heeled midline incision. And he had this operation done decades ago for stenosis. Um, and you can see what he's doing here, right? Look at his scapula, look at his shoulders, look at his lumbar spine. You can just see what he's doing, right? He's hyper, he's arching his back back. He can't look straight. And this is impacting his quality of life. And for years and years, he tried physical therapy, massages, trigger point injections, and I was basically told, uh, you know, there's really nothing to do here. I mean, you had surgery uh, and there's no spinal cord compression, uh, no radicular signs, no myelopathic signs. And these are his x-rays, right? So this is looking at him, but now with see-through vision, what does he look like, right? And you can see here, he's got multiple laminectomies here. So, you know, the, you, the, both your spinal elements are gone. You can see the impact in the facet joints. You see the wedging of the vertebral bodies. This is uh, C5, C6, C7. You can see the collapse that's there. And just look at the supine MRI and look at the standing x-ray, right? So you look at the supine MRI and you may think of this and be like, oh, okay, what's the big deal? Uh, it looks okay. I mean, it's not great, but it looks okay. Then you look at the standing x-ray and it's really pretty obvious. But what about that soft tissue prominence, right? Well, this is what it is. And we had no idea what that was. Turned out it was just liquefied hematoma that was just uh, prominent over time. Again, we can go through our exercise here. And I did this uh, operation. My strategy here was through a combined posterior, anterior, and posterior operation. And before these studies, I always get CT scans, look at the facet joints, look at the degree of ankylosis, uh, fusion across. And uh, this, this, this patient was quite rigid. And so I performed this through a posterior operation first to uh, really uh, cut out the posterior uh, elements in terms of the facet joints, then with an anterior approach and followed by a posterior approach to lock all that in. And I use bivector traction. And so what that means is that patients in Gardner-Wells tongs, we have one set of weights going straight out through the Jackson table and have another set of weights that go over the top to allow me to sort of uh, manipulate the head and to not only translate it, but to elevate the head and to provide closure when we're doing these type of osteotomies. Do this case with neural monitoring. And uh, this is the setup. And so, you know, with uh, the head in Gardner-Wells tongs, obviously there's nothing below supporting uh, that. So it gives the anesthesiologist access to the endotracheal tube, the neural monitoring team access to the various cables and wires. And, uh, you know, so for me, what I do is I attach these towel clamps to the actual Gardner Wells tongs. So they're almost like antennas, right? Or goalposts, right? So, um, you know, I tell my residents, it's kind of like uh, American football where we, we know where the goalposts are. So at any time, for whatever reason, if I need to grab the head or if something changes, I can always grab, I know exactly where that is. Um, and that's just the illustration of what that looks like. And you can see here the prominent kyphosis relative to the horizontal bar of the, uh, the Jackson table. And that's just what that looks like here. Uh, and again, the bivector traction. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So this uh, to the left of the screen is cranial and to the right is caudal. So you can see uh, there's some instrumentation there at C2. And then I have some of uh, the uh, posterior thoracic pedicle screws instrumentation. Spinal cord, this is a fecal sac, and you can see at each level, I've already drilled the starting points to the lateral mass screws here, because uh, I find that one, once I do that first uh, before anything, so we expose, get the retractors in, localize the levels, I use the Midas drill, and I just I just put the starting points of the lateral mass screws, I cannulate them with a CD4 drill, 
uh, get that uh, all squared away, but I don't put the screws in because when you put the screws in, it really kind of uh, obscures your visualization of the bone and impacts the way that you drill out. So I do all the bone work to get the trajectories in first, and then I do the decompression, I do the osteotomy, and I, I take that all the way out. And you can see that. You can see here this level of the nerve root going all the way out, uh, this nerve root going all the way out as well at each single level. And you can see it's a pedicle to pedicle. So there's no overhang whatsoever, okay? And now sometimes when you do this, it does impact, uh, let's say that most distal tip of where your screw would go. And if there's any concern, especially patients with horrible deformity and degeneration, uh, I then use, I basically put pedicle screws into the cervical spine as my bailout sort of uh, technique. And again, I, I do that um, with just visualization. So I visualize the pedicle, I take the CD4 drill and I, I just drill right into the pedicle without using fluoro navigation. Though there are a lot of techniques for that, uh, but that's the workhorse for me. So for me, lateral mass screws, bailout strategy is gonna be cervical pedicle screws. Uh, if needed, which is really provides excellent fixation, actually much better than uh, lateral mass. Uh, and then after that's done, so after this was done, we basically do the osteotomies, then I'll place the screws here. You can see what that looks like, right? Um, and then uh, release that enough, and then we'll close this, go through the front, multi-level ACD, then go into the back, lock in the rods, compress against the rods to maximize lower doses and finish it. And again, that was the technique, posterior, anterior, and then posterior. And you can see here what that looks like. And now um, this is a full standing x-ray. You can see when he's standing, what I did in the front was I did not plate that page. I did not plate anteriorly. So with the posterior releases, I'm able to loosen up the spine. Then with the anterior approach, cast bar distraction posts, anterior osteotomies, aggressive resection of the anterior osteophytes. Uh, I place lordotic cages, and then I just place a screw as like a kickout screw, similar to what we do for A-lifts when we know that we're going posteriorly. I just place a screw that is a, a kickout screw that wedges into the vertebral body uh, without plating it so that when I go into the back on the third stage, I'm able to not only compress, but I can grab the tongs and I can raise that up, lock in the screws and the rods, and uh, that maximizes the lordosis. And this is post-op, this is what that patient looks like, okay? He's doing very well, this is now several years out. Um, I have two last cases and we'll get to questions. This is a patient who basically comes in with severe myelopathy, wheelchair bound, uh, symptom progression over several months, can't stand, severe myelopathy, okay? This is what the MRI shows, okay? So you can see horrible degeneration. It's almost like part of the spine has like switched back uh, between C3 and C6. Uh, and um, uh, this is what that looks like. You can see there's uh, stenosis and compression. Again, just a snapshot. It doesn't speak to the severity of it, but really shows uh, the, the extent of what we're dealing with here, okay? In the CT scan, you can see what that subaxial spine looks like. These are the standing cervical spine x-rays. Again, several blocks of those vertebral bodies are really pitched back posteriorly. And now look at, you know, supine and upright. You can see where her shoulders are. Her shoulders are up at her ears, right? Um, and this makes visualizing things quite difficult. So again, go through that exercise, bivector traction. I did this through, again, posterior multi-column osteotomies, um, same technique as before. And now with the uh, different instrumentation systems, uh, and this just shows how our technology is evolving. We're able to do really significant correction, even reduction uh, of uh, deformities like this through posterior approaches alone. And this is what I did. And this is a 4055 rod. Uh, that I used uh, with uh, correction and uh, reduction. And uh, you can see here, post-op was able to get those vertical, so the vertebral bodies realigned. And that's just really reduction between the cervical instrumentation here. You can see how powerful that can be with uh, great fixation in the cervical spine above and below with a contoured rod using reduction towers, Gardner-Wells tongs, it's able to really reduce that. So in addition to the laminectomy, you can see I, I decompressed extensively, uh, you know, maximally decompressing the spine according to the elements, but also using these techniques to reduce the spine, uh, it can be very effective. And that's her x-ray post-op, okay? 
Uh, this is a patient who underwent laminectomy, instrumented fusion for stenosis, had hardware failure, have hardware failure uh, done uh, um, in a different uh, part of the country, came in to see me. You can see multiple issues here, uh, chin on chest deformity, some motion, right? Flexion extension. But again, you can see here with extension, look at that occipital C2 angle here. Look what's going on there, right? At the cranial vertebral junction. And yeah, you could say that with maximal extension, they have neutral gaze, but look at that standing scoliosis x-ray, right? And that's very similar to that x-ray that, that uh, cartoon I showed before. So this case, we did a three column PSO, right? Challenges with PSO, it's very difficult to visualize the cervical thoracic junction. Uh, and so, but this can be very powerful, whether you do this at C7, T1, can be very powerful to close the spine and get that uh, closure. But you have to be mindful of the nerve roots here. You have to be mindful of, you know, uh, what's going to happen when you close that osteotomy. And again, Gardner Wells tongs, prone Jackson table, bivector traction. And this is an image. Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, to the left is cranial, right is caudal. You can see the cervical instrumentation, thoracic instrumentation. Uh, this is uh, this I've done, this was my one of my earliest cases. This is a C7 PSO. So C7 nerve root you can see here, C8 nerve root here, Penfield four, uh, just you know create just gently mobilizing the shoulder of that C8 nerve root. Here I'm using navigation to help me guide where I'm going because it can be hard to visualize, right? Uh, the vertebral artery is laterally, spinal cord and nerve root is here. There are a lot of landmines here. So navigation can be very helpful. This gives me an idea of my depth, my trajectory. How deep am I? Am I in the body? Am I anteriorly? I don't want to be in the esophagus. I don't want to be anterior to the spine. I don't want to be in the end plate above and below. And remember, these patients are kyphotic, so you can easily uh, misrepresent sort of where we're going with that. And this is just a picture of what that navigation screenshot looks like. Again, this just shows me in real time. Yes, I'm down that pedicle. I'm on. I'm following that lateral wall of the vertebral body. I know how far I am. I know how deep I am because I don't want to break through that anterior cortex. And for me, I find it very helpful because it's such a narrow corridor. And, you know, we can pack it. We can use thrombotic agents, gel foam, do different things. But, you know, the epidural bleeding can kick up and can be very difficult to assess where we're going. We published this technique several years ago, uh, and it's been very helpful. So I use navigation a lot. Not to, I don't use navigation to necessarily put in screws, but I use it to help plan osteotomies. I do this for on-block resections, for uh, spinal tumors, chordomas, chondrosarcomas. Uh, revision tumor operations, and I also use this in cases of complex uh, deformity uh, to help plan the osteotomies and to really give me an additional, almost like artificial intelligence sense of where I am uh, relative to these structures. And I find it very helpful, especially in the revision context. And this is what we want to avoid. This is one of my earliest cases and I'm not afraid to show this. I mean, we all learn from our failures. And an earlier case where I did not use navigation and I breached the anterior cortex. And basically I was able to correct the deformity, but you can see what happened here. I, I basically went through and through and I sheared across and it was not ideal, right? Not ideal. Um, and you actually lose some ability to correct when you do that. And this is the result. I was able to contour the rod. We use Gardner Wells tongs, bring the head up to the rod. And you can see here uh, that does not impact the cranial O2 junction here. Okay. Um, and I find that much more effective than using the Mayfield head holder in my experience. This is what it looks like with the screw, with the uh, nerve roots now kissing together, closing that foramen. You can see the buckling of the dura that's there. And, uh, and now we can supplement that with dual rods fixating across the cervical thoracic junction. My last case here is basically a patient who underwent laminoplasty. And I have a video I'm gonna show. So this is a patient who underwent laminoplasty, right? Very good operation for stenosis, almost a decade ago, out of state, um, and uh, comes in basically with this, uh, with kyphosis, more neck pain, that SVA is now more than four centimeters, T1 cervical lordosis is greater than 20 degrees, kyphosis more than 25 degrees, and uh, this patient underwent posterior cervical decompression and fusion across the cervical thoracic junction. Neck pain got better, but you can see here the SVA is actually worse and the alignment really didn't change. We, we, may, we addressed the kyphosis, but we didn't address the SVA. Worse pain over time, several more years, that SVA is getting worse. Now it's seven centimeters. Look at what it was before, right? And look where it is now, right? This patient is miserable. So 
we go through our algorithm, we go through various parameters here, and we did this through a, a, a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, and this is the setup. So you can see where my navigation tower is, by vector traction, and uh, this is the video showing that. So now what I do to help this, I use the bone scalpel. We navigate the bone scalpel here. This is uh, to the right is cranial, left is caudal. I have a temporary rod across the cervical thoracic junction. So this is actually a 5.5 five diameter screw, but with a smaller uh, head cap that's the same size as a lateral mass screw so that I can actually compress against that, uh, which I'll show you. So again, this is at the T2 level. I'm using the uh, navigated uh, bone scalpel. So as I'm doing these cuts to the vertebral body, I'm seeing that on the navigation screen. And that's why I take a pause here so I can look at my depth while my assistant is protecting those nerve roots. And so I can use that bone scalpel to get not only lateral to the vertebral body, make that lateral cut, but I can dive all the way, drop my hand and go all the way underneath and resect as much as I can uh, to the contralateral side. I'm gonna do this on both sides. And you can see there what that looks like. You can see the cut above, you can see the cut below. And here again, I, I, I'm making that cut through that lateral vertebral body wall. You can see when that bone scalpel just kind of gives way a little bit. Uh, and that can be very helpful. And again, we can see that we've made cuts on both sides. You have the nerve roots there. You can see what that is. We mobilize the fecal sac. And I'm basically showing you, we can see how loose it is now. You can see that I'm moving it side to side and it's pretty loose, okay? So we freed it up above, below, laterally. I use navigation to check that anterior border. I know I didn't break through. And now for the closure, I put a hinged rod Again, this patient's in garden walls tongs. I just take a hinged rod that we have in the occipital cervical and I use this to really help guide. And for the last step, I use an osteotome, which we also can navigate to really complete that release, okay? Because there's always something, there's always some band, there's always something that needs, needs to be freed up. And so that's the wedge that comes out to the retrieval body. Finally, we you know use forceps to uh, pituitary to remove. Uh, additional bone fragments or ligamentous attachments. The posterior longitudinal ligament has to be resected and taken down completely. And uh, once we have that channel open, I'm using a down angled curette or a Woodson to make sure that that's clear. And then basically you can see here that when we're doing the closure, right? You can see the dura buckling, compressing there. And you can see how much mobility we have. Now, now keep in mind, these are not the final rods, but it's all about doing things in steps, right? And using ligament taxis and really bringing things together, getting the correction, seeing what I can get, knowing that I can get the correction. And I use that as a template to set up the stage for final rod contouring. And here we've done this on both sides. You know, I'm bringing up the Gardner Wells tongs. I'm putting the pressure. You can see that the patient's jumping because we get motors. And then and I use a compressor and I just basically compress and I complete that osteotomy. You can see the dura buckling. You can see that coming together. And once I have that, then what I'll do is, you know, we'll get x-rays, check monitoring. I'll swap out one of the sides, place in the final rod, do the same thing, lock that in, place in the final rod on the other side, and then um, we'll lock it in. But with the Gardner Wells tongs and we switch the weight, we add additional weight to the top vector with that alignment, it really nicely holds that all together, okay? Um, and as you can see here, so we've uh, I've done the closure by the Gardner Wells tongs, but also getting additional compression using the compressor, uh, which helps me uh, finish the osteotomy there. Okay, and we're able to get three foot x-rays in the operating room, and that's what that looks like. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, I know I went through a lot of material, definitely wanna take some questions. Uh, and so assessment of alignment is important. Uh, now we're working on using artificial intelligence integrated surgical planning tools. Uh, integrate alignment with x-rays real time. And again, I can't emphasize enough, it's complications avoidance, understanding the frailty, studying the frailty, thinking about the medical surgical potential complications, the invasiveness of surgery and patient reported outcomes. My last slide, I'm just gonna highlight here, we recently published a, a critical analysis and review of the association of spinal alignment correction with patient reported outcomes in the uh, cervical deformity literature. Uh, this is published recently in NeuroSpine. And uh, what we did is we investigated, I wanted to see, you know, how do these patient reported outcomes really uh, correlate with radiographic outcomes in the literature? And you'll be surprised, um, you know, 
everyone uses different tools. It could be the NIH Promise Scales, it could be NDI, VAST, JOA, and uh, everything in red here basically shows that there's been poor correlation in the literature. And uh, this is, a, I mean, I obviously I'm biased, but I think it's a great paper, but it really highlights things to think about in terms of your own practice, how you assess outcomes in your patients. Uh, and it shows our paper basically showed that the NDI was really had the best correlation with patient reported outcomes in the setting. So with that, um, I'll conclude. That leaves us uh, several minutes for uh, questions and discussion. But again, uh, thank you for having me. I hope this was helpful, educational. I hope it challenged you in ways. And uh, I'm very happy to take any uh, questions uh, either here or feel free to contact me, uh, email, Twitter, whatnot. I'm very happy to engage. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture, Dr. Sheen. I'm sure all the audience has learned from your robust experience. So we've got um, a few questions from the public. Dr. Madrignan is asking, uh, thank you for such a wonderful lecture. In an otherwise healthy young patient with acute non-specific cervical pain, one finds an inversion or loss of cervical lordosis. If neurological exam is normal, how would you proceed or follow this patient? That's a great question. You know, I think in those cases, uh, if there's no neurologic uh, condition, uh, we basically will try to maximize physical therapy. So I send that patient to a physical, uh, like a physiatrist, a, a rehabilitation specialist who can work on muscle relaxants, different type of trigger point injections, a lot of stretching, you know, uh, they can try things like acupuncture, but we try to really try to maximize uh, behavior modification and uh, therapies. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, what were the main advantages of cervical pedicle screws over lateral mass screws in terms of biomechanics? Would the levels of arthrodesis be different in both options? Thank you, uh, thank you, Humberto, thank you, thank you very much. So uh, basically, the cervical pedicle screws are, are very powerful because it lets you, it gets you access to um, uh, ventral to the axis of rotation in the cervical spine biomechanically, right? So you can get longer points of fixation. You can place 18, 20 millimeter screws deep into the vertebral bodies, and you're just going to have better pullout strength. Uh, now, clearly the risk is, it depends on the width of the pedicle. It depends on the relationship of the vertebral artery relative to that. Uh, and most cervical pedicles tend to be quite narrow and tall. So there's some considerations there. Uh, for arthrodesis, you're right. The challenge when you're doing these osteotomies is that you're taking all this bone away laterally, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I still place as much bone graft as possible laterally to the screws, uh, not necessarily in the foramen. Uh, what I do is I, I'll put like a strip of gel foam over the nerve root so that the bone graft is not falling directly over the nerve root. Uh, but that's my strategy. Wonderful, doctor. And continuing with this uh, topic line about screws. Um, I must ask you, Dr. Shin, during a screw fixation in the cervical spine, once you have used pedicle screw entry, in, the, in cases that uh, this entry fails, what rescue entry must one use? That's a really good point. I mean, for me, the bailout is a cervical screw. And I think if that doesn't work, uh, what I do is I, I drill out the pedicle and I put in a vertebral body screw. I'll basically put a screw as deep as I can into the vertebral body. And it definitely leaves a shank of the screw uh, proud, but it's better than nothing. And it provides me at least with something. So you can imagine like the tulip will, the tulip will be up here and the screw may be exposed, but then I have a decent length of screw that's in the vertebral body. It, it gives me another point of fixation. So I, I use that as well. Believe me, I mean, it, when you do enough of these cases, you need a backup to a backup to a backup strategy. Perfect, wonderful. Our next question says, uh, do you use a fixed number of levels with degeneration to decide whether to go posterior or anterior? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I think that, you know, I, 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 in degenerative cases, I really prefer the anterior cervical approach. I think it's really a workhorse. I think especially with focal kyphosis correction, restoration of foraminal height. Uh, me personally, I don't really believe in indirect decompression in the cervical spine. For me, in the cervical spine, I'm going all in, you know, so... Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a maximalist in that way. So I'm like, if we commit to surgery, I'm going to do everything I can in that exposure to get the maximal decompression correction. And so I'll, I'll, I'll take apart as much as I can. And so I find that effective one, two, three levels. In that one case, I showed four, but that's rare. 
um, but I'll do three levels, uh, you know, uh, routinely uh, to address that. And it's just weighing anterior versus posterior. For most things over three levels, depending on the age and other risk factors, uh, I'll, I may go posterior. Thank you, doctor. Um, in the patient with cervical hump and kyphosis that you showed us, the lowest instrumented le uh, level seemed to have an anatomical trajectory of the pedicle screw. Did you have concerns from DJK or pull out in this uh, specific case? Yeah, that's a great case. I mean, that was one of my uh, earlier cases, that C7 PSO, and you're totally right. So I stopped that uh, operation, I think, a little short. And since that time, now I go much further down. So uh, you're right. So I try to make that lowest instrument of vertebrae, especially for a three-column osteotomy. So if I'm doing a three-column osteotomy, a T1, T2, I'm taking that all the way to about T8 to even T10 to get as, as straightforward uh, as possible. In general, I, I put in my thoracic pedicle screws with freehand technique, and I basically use straight, uh, straightforward approach. Uh, I'm not necessarily trying to make it anatomic, but I think at the upper thoracic spine, because of the kyphosis, it's very hard to really visualize, and I, I don't want to break that end plate. And so at the upper thoracic spine between T1 and T4, oftentimes it, it, it turns out to almost look like an anatomic approach because of our uh, of our angle, but you're right, that lowest instrument of vertebrae, I, I take much further down now because that case actually two years out, she did develop uh, DJK. So that's a great point. Thank you. Dr. Julian Andraus is asking, and thank you, Dr. Shin, excellent lecture. In patients with ankylosing spondylitis and atl atlantoaxial subluxation, which are your personal considerations regarding preoperative planning for this type of deformity? Yeah, I think with ink spawned, uh, you know, I think that the challenge here is that, you know, they, they have problems affecting their entire spinal column, lumbar and cervical. And so it really depends on what the driver is, right? What's driving their symptoms and what really can wait. And so in those cases, I really try to address the flat back, uh, try to adjust their lumbar spine first, to at least get them to better balance uh, and see what they need first. If they're horribly myelopathic and suffering from that, then you know, we do the best that we can, especially the cranial vertebral junction. Uh, you know, if we need to go to the occiput, I will. But I think that if there is evidence of instability there, then uh, extension to the occiput is definitely um, reasonable to do. Perfect. Dr. Benavides is asking, what did you do when screws are in the vertebral foramen on postoperative period and patients are as asymptomatic? I leave it alone. I, I don't bother. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we'll get a tip of the screw into the foramen and, uh, you know, sometimes the residents or fellows will be like, oh, there's, you know, CT looks okay. There's something in the uh, foramen. And, and, you know, my response is, I think it looks awesome, you know? So I think it, uh, I think it, uh, it's all subjective, but I think that uh, a lot of the times it's not, you know, I think the radiologists freak out because they think the screws are like sharp and pointy. And you, as you know, the, the tips of the screws are quite blunt. And, you know, uh, it's not, you know, most of these situations, unless you're through and through the frame and I find are, are not really problematic. Okay, perfect. Um, Dr. Sheen, I must ask you, what is your opinion in cervical correction deformity using endoscopic approaches? You know, I personally don't have any experience with using the endoscope, um, and so I really can't comment that. I do think it's a fantastic technology. I've definitely watched a lot of uh, peers uh, demonstrate that. You know, I, I do use and have uh, explored using the scope for visualization of force structures, um, especially navigating around the vertebral artery, especially in tumor situations when we're kind of really circumferentially going around the spinal column. But I, I haven't really applied in this context. So if anyone has that insight, please share with me because I'd love to see it or see someone's talk about that. Okay, thank you. And uh, continuing with this uh, neuronavigation topic, uh, in which cases does neuronavigation of the spine turns mandatory? Uh, you know, mandatory, I, I think it's hard to say mandatory because I think we all have different risk tolerances and things that we're comfortable with. Um, but I do think it's a very helpful, safe adjunct. As long as you have access to it, as long as you have those resources, um, I, I do think it's helpful because it just gives you some uh, extra level of visualization, you know, and I think that now uh, there's so many different types of imaging platforms, navigation platforms, maybe even augmented reality, virtual reality. I think whatever resources you have in your hospital with your team that helps you, uh, I, I, I advocate for it. I mean, a lot of cases in my cases, whether deformity or, or, or uh, tumor, 
I have it in the room and I'll do a spin. We'll get an intraoperative CT and I'll have it just to, you know, and sometimes I say, you know what, it's like complex surgery. You just, you can't just stick to the plan, right? You can't just stick to like what you thought about the day before the night before you, we have to be flexible. And, you know, if you need additional tools and do it. So I don't have a specific algorithm, but I do find it very helpful to have as an adjunct. Wonderful. Um, is there any algorithm you use in order to predict which patients initially managed with conservative treatment are going to be future candidates for spinal surgery? And is there any radiologic characteristic you use in order to get an idea of future progression to spinal deformity? Yeah, I think that's that's really tricky. And I think that uh, I don't have a specific algorithm. So right now, what we're trying to do in our research group is we're trying to use artificial intelligence to look at all those three foot scoliosis x-rays that I showed you. We're trying to look at that, look at uh, post-operative films, normal controls, and we're trying to uh, develop any kind of predictive models looking at in things like alignment and also bone density on those imaging to look at things that predispose patients to develop worsening deformities or things like pull out or DJK, because that's really the concern, you know? Where to start, stop? I think all of us as spine surgeons, we struggle with that. So um, I don't have the answer to that, but it's something that we're actively working on, you know? So, um, uh, but that's a great question. Well, very interesting. And the next question is about uh, osteoporosis. Is there any strategy you use in order to reduce uh, pseudoarthrosis risk in these patients? Yeah, so patients with, uh, so part of uh, this is always, you know, the assessment of the patients beforehand, right? So I always, I do a bone uh, density. So we do a DEXA scan. I try to see what the T-scores are. And as all you know, I think that the, the, the relationship of, you know, the T-score in the hip and relative to the spine or, you know, the forearm, wherever you're measuring it, it's, it's not so consistent, but it gives us an idea of what the bone health is like for that patient. And in many cases, we'll try to optimize that patients with endocrinology, medical therapy if needed. If patient can tolerate it, we'll put them on anabolic agents for, you know, six months, even a year before they can tolerate it. Uh, in terms of surgical, I'll use uh, cement augmentation, uh, you know, uh, to help with the, the screw pullout as well. Um, I don't use things like bands or tethers uh, for cervical deformity, um, but we use that for thoracolumbar lumbar, uh, lumbar deformity. Uh, but yeah, so we use augmentation, um, various uh, you know side connectors to the screws. If if I'm really worried. I'll go to cervical pedicle screws first and not so much a lateral mass screws. Sometimes in these cases, the degeneration of the facets is so severe that the lateral masses, as you know, by the time you kind of prepare it, there's not much there and they just sort of break off. So uh, I, I'm quite liberal in using uh, cervical pedicle screws if I need, because I, I just find that they provide the best point of fixation. Thank you, doctor. In cases with uh, cervical spondylodysitis, did you wait to control the infection with a short of antibiotics before the treatment on instrument. And yeah, yeah, I think that primarily, I think that the goal is to try to maximize medical therapies first. And I think it just depends on the patient's neurological status. I think that in the lumbar spine, I think we're, I, I definitely am, am more conservative with surgery, but I think in the cervical and thoracic spine, I, I'm, I'm particularly more worried about that patient because I think that because of the vascular supply to the cord and also because of, uh, you know, the, there's just not much space there. And so I think that those patients need to be followed closely. So I think if they have pain, neurologically intact, ambulatory, and they're doing okay, they can be managed with antibiotics. And that's typically our management course here at the MGH. But if they're, you know, having progressive pain, they're having difficulty mobilizing, you know, and, you know, you know, they're, they've been on antibiotics, but not necessarily improving, uh, then we'll go for debridement, wash out and uh, instrumented fixation. But, you know, for me, the infection, it's not a barrier to instrumenting. I mean, we instrument quite often in the context of active infection. And I just think that we know that the patient's going to be on uh, antibiotic suppressive therapy. And, uh, but, you know, in our infectious disease doctors are also, they, they actually, they push us to operate quite a bit more than we like, you know, so it, it's not like uh, just because they have infection that that's a barrier. Okay, perfect. Um, I believe we've got two more questions. Okay. So um, for cervical pedicle screws followed by anterior fixation, the trajectories may be too close to one another. And in osteopenic patients, this may, may be unsuitable. I agree, however, uh, 
and pedicles will have excellent purchase and is biomechanical very assuring. Excellent talk. Thank you. Well, I believe that was a commentary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, when, when you're putting in screws in the front and the back, you have to think about where they're going, right? Because the last thing you want to do is put a screw in the front and you kick out a screw from the back or same thing. I mean, there's limited real estate, especially in the cervical spine. So, but, you know, it's just, you know, I, I've never really found a problem with that having, uh, you know, impacting the other screw and we can, we can work around that. Okay, thank you. Um, did you find there is a benefit to using monoaxial screws posteriorly to help with deformity correction? Um, I think it depends on the type of deformity, but yes, I will use uh, monoaxial screws on occasion. Uh, depending on the type of system you use, there are different uh, instrumentation systems where the polyaxial head can actually lock into a mono head. I find those very helpful. Uh, and so, um, you know, some of these uh, systems have like a dual diameter head that allow you to place a normal polyaxial screw, but if you need, uh, you can lock that into mono and to do the correction that you need. Um, but, uh, but like when I do a lumbar PSO, I'm not necessarily uh, putting in a, um, a monoaxial screw, but um, for really rigid um, uh, deformities or, you know, sometimes uh, for VCRs, especially VCRs in the thoracic spine, I will use monoaxial screws because I do feel that that gives me really uh, much more aggressive uh, correction. Uh, usually with those, I'll put the monoaxial screws and place long extension reduction towers so that it gives me something to really apply different forces to correct that deformity. Okay, <coughs> and I'm afraid we have, um, well, the last question. Okay. So, did you ever stage the procedures with traction between stages? Uh, not necessarily between stages. You know, I just found that, um, you know, I know that people use traction quite a bit. I, I, I found for many reasons, traction just stresses everybody out in the hospital. The effect, it stresses out the nurses, it stresses out the residents, the patients real, are really uncomfortable. And so for me, I have them in the operating room. They get muscle relaxants, general anesthesia, monitoring. I prefer like intraoperative traction, you know, so uh, I, I use traction, traction a lot for cervical deformity, but it's really in the operating room. Okay, thank you. So on behalf of CN, I'd like to thank you once again, Dr. Shin. This has been a wonderful lecture and we are really grateful and honored for your participation here in the 2021 IWBNC. No, great. Thank you so much. And uh, again, it's wonderful to be here. I I'm very sorry I went over time, but uh, I, uh, I love the questions. And again, please feel free to reach out or if anyone ever wants to visit, uh, uh, please let me know. I think there's a lot that we always learn from each other. So thank you so much and for having me. Well, thank you. Thank you, doctor. And for all the audience, keep in mind, this lecture will be available on our website starting next week. And on the other room, we have Dr. Mark Bilski doing his lecture on minimal access surgery for spine tumors. Is less, actually more. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned on the chat screen or check the program schedule on our website, cnhul.com. Dr. Shin, thank you once again. Thank you. <laughs>